Um, for the last four weeks, we've been uh, in a series called The Comeback Story. And the first week, I'll, I'll catch you up in case you've not been here. The first week, we talked about uh, how sometimes things in our life that we see as a setback are actually a setup for a comeback. And so uh, it's a matter of perspective. We see things that uh, happen in our life. We think God's trying to punish us, but in reality, God's trying to set us up for something better. And so it's all about how we see things. It's not God trying to destroy us. It's try God trying to set us up to give him glory. And then last, uh, se two weeks ago, uh, the second week of the series, uh, we talked about that our failure is not final. And whether you're a believer or whether you're not, we all fail. But because of the message of Jesus, our failure is not final. And that means that when we fall and it feels like we've really messed it up and it feels like things are destroyed and it feels like things uh, are all going wrong, that's not final. God can clean up our mess. God can pick us back up no matter how many times we fall. And then last week, we learned that all of us have some scars. All of us have some things in our past that are, we're not exactly proud of. But instead of tucking those things under the rug or hiding them for the rest of our lives, we learned that our scars can be the sermons that change people's lives. And so when we share with people how God has worked and moved in our lives, uh, that can change the way people see Jesus. And so our scars, shows God's, our sh scars show God's faithfulness in the midst of all life's pain and sorrow. And today I want to finish up this comeback series uh, with a sermon entitled, The Ultimate Comeback Story. The Ultimate Comeback Story story. But before we get into the message today, would you pray with me one more time? Uh, just pray for me. I'll pray for you. Everybody gets prayed for. How about that? So let's pray. Father, we, uh, we come to you right now, and Lord, we realize that we need you, Father. We need you in this moment, and we ask that, that, that in our few moments together where we open your word and we uh, uh, we, we look to learn more about you, Father. I pray that you would change our lives. Father, I pray that you would change our hearts and our minds. Lord, help us to see you more clearly because of these next few moments. Father, hide me behind your cross. You be sufficient where I'm insufficient. And, and God, I pray that you would just do something amazing today in us. We love you and we thank you for everything. And it's through Jesus we pray. And amen. Well, we all know that today is Resurrection Sunday. We all know that, I, I'll give you the end of the story right now. We all know that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, or even if you don't believe that, you've heard that at some point. But... The resurrection is not really where the story starts. It's, that's not where it all begins. And I want us to go back uh, to be the beginning of the story because I don't think you can understand the hope of the resurrection without understanding the hopelessness of the cross. I don't think you can understand the hope of the resurrection unless you understand the hopelessness of the cross. And I don't think you can appreciate Sunday if you don't know what happened on Friday. And so we want to go back and just for a few minutes we want to look at, at, at Friday, but I don't want us to look at it through our perspective because uh, we've kind of been in church all of our life. We may have heard this story hundreds and hundreds of times, but, but I want us to look at Friday and Saturday and Sunday through the perspective of Jesus' disciples because I feel like they have a little different perspective on these events than we do. And so uh, the thing about the thing about Sunday is Sunday is when the success happened, but Friday is where the pain was. And so many times we see people who are successful and we envy their success, but we don't realize how much pain they went through to get that success. 
We see people when they're in their Sunday, and we think, man, I wish I could have that, but oftentimes we're not willing to go through the pain that it takes to get to that success. And so uh, we're going to go back and, and kind of get the whole story of the disciples and, and their perspective on, on the cross. And so what we need to understand right off the bat is that uh, the disciples, they were not religious, uh, especially religious when Jesus found them. Uh, they were not especially bright. They were not especially smart. They were pretty average when Jesus found them. And the disciples had all left something to follow Jesus. And they had been following him for about three and a half years. And they literally, when Jesus said, follow me, they literally followed Jesus everywhere. Every step that he took, they were right behind him. Every move that he made, they were right behind him. Everything that Jesus done, the disciples done. And when you spend three and a half years with somebody doing that, you get pretty close to them. When you walk in someone's footsteps for three and a half years, you get to know that person and you get to understand that person and you get close to that person and you have some expectations of that person. And in those three and a half years, they seen Jesus do some pretty amazing things. They seen Jesus cure uncurable diseases. They seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with nothing more than a Jewish lunchable. They seen Jesus walk on water. They seen Jesus raise people back to life. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but we need to understand something about the Messiah from Jewish perspective. When we pick up in our story, Jesus, or God has not spoke to the nation of Israel for over 300 years since the prophet Malachi has died in the Old Testament. There was 300 years of silence from God to man and the nation of Israel. And what you need to understand about the nation of Israel is that the nation of Israel had spent more time in captivity and oppression than they had in freedom and rule in their own kingdom. And so the nation of Israel spent some time under Egyptian rule. Um, they spent some time under Babylonian rule. They spent some time under Persian rule. And now when we pick up in Jesus' day and time, they're ruled by the Romans. They're taxed by the Romans. And so the nation of Israel, when they think about the Messiah, they think about somebody who is finally going to free them from the Romans. When they think about the Messiah, they don't think the way we think. They think that the Messiah, when he comes, he will be a, a reigning and ruling king. He will be some kind of military power that will come and rise up or raise up a rebellion and, and push back the Romans. They think that when the Messiah comes, he will raise an army in Israel and, and finally they will be free. He will be their king and, and they can rule their land according to their laws. They won't have to pay any taxes to a foreign government. And, and when they think about the Messiah, they think we're finally going to be free from Rome. And so they expected the Messiah to be a mighty warrior and a reigning king. They, they thought when the disciples followed Jesus and they, they began to believe that he was the Messiah, they honestly believed that at some point Jesus would raise up an army and, and that he would fight against the Romans and that he would be their king. That's what the disciples expected from Jesus. They expected that at some point things would start shifting around and, and they would become rulers in the kingdom when Jesus finally pushed out the Roman Empire. And so when the, the, the disciples, they had this expectation of Jesus. And, and we read the, the New Testament, but we know the whole picture. We understand what Jesus was doing. But when the disciples heard a, a passage of Scripture, or they heard Jesus say something like, 
he who the Son has set free is free indeed. They thought that when Jesus said that, he was meaning when I set Israel free, they will be free forever. They interpreted Jesus in a different way than we do. Now they were thinking about being free from Roman Empire. And so they believed for three and a half years that, that any day now Jesus will raise up a rebellion and we will finally be free from these Romans. We will finally come through. And he said, uh, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. They thought he meant to be lifted up as uh, the new king of Israel. But what he meant was that when he was lifted up on the cross... So they spend three and a half years with Jesus and then on a Sunday, the Sunday before Passover, uh, Jesus comes into the, the, the capital in, in Jerusalem and he's riding on a donkey and everybody starts shouting Messiah, Messiah, Hosanna, Hosanna. And the disciples must have thought this is the beginning. We, what we thought was going to happen is finally going to happen. And we're finally going to be free from the nation of Rome. And we're finally going to be our own nation. And then Jesus starts saying things through that week like, It's almost my time. My time, my appointed time has almost come. Jesus sits down on Thursday night with his disciples at the Last Supper. And he says, One of you will betray me. And Judas had already arranged with the government of that day to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And then later that night, Jesus would come into the garden and he would be praying and literally carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, literally sweating drops of blood from his forehead. And in the distance, the disciples would have heard the clanging of armor. And the flickering of torches out in the darkness as a, a big crew of soldiers approached them. And that night some of the religious leaders and the temple guard would come into the garden to arrest Jesus. And it would have been Judas that led them right to him. And th these guards, they come up to Jesus and Jesus says... Who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus who is called the Christ. And he says, I am he. And all of the soldiers that were with them fell. And in that moment, the disciples must have thought, now is the time. Our time is now the time for the rebellion, the time for us to rise up as leaders is finally here. And Peter gets so excited that he pulls out his sword and cuts off one of their ears. But Jesus says, Peter, you don't understand that that's not how I'm going to establish my kingdom. And he puts his ear back on. And then... From this time on, things go from bad to worse. Have you ever had a situation go from bad to worse really quick? Like, really quick things you thought, you had expectations and you thought it was going to be one way and then it happened and it was the total other way? That's what happened to the disciples. Things go from bad to worse. Somebody say, it's a setup. It's a setup. They, they think that, that one thing is happening, but it's a setup. The disciples watch as they arrest Jesus, and Jesus don't even put up a fight. They arrest Jesus, and he doesn't even put up a fight. And Jesus is looking less and less like the Messiah every second. He's looking less and less what, like what they thought he would be. They take Jesus to trial, and they're making accusations against Jesus, but Jesus never responds to one of the accusations. They take Jesus to Pilate. They punch him. They spit on him. They 
call him names, they shame him. But Jesus never responds. This does not look what, like what they expected to happen. This was not what they expected. This does not look like the Messiah. They hit him, they punched him, and then Pilate, because he could find no fault in him, he had him flogged with the cat of nine tails. Literally, it, it, it was a whip that would rip the flesh from the body. And as the Romans were whipping Jesus, I can just imagine the disciples were somewhere thinking, this is not what I expected. This is not what I expected. And this is not what I signed up for. You ever been there? You, th you thought that following Jesus was going to make your life so much better and then uh, th you still have problems and reality is still there and you say, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I expected. Things keep getting worse and... But it's a setup. It's a setup. They think that it's one thing, but it's another thing. Pilate could find no fault in Jesus, and he was trying to get out of killing an innocent man that he knew was innocent. And so he said, I tell you what, I'm either going to release Jesus or Barabbas. And he thought that the crowds would say, well, release Jesus. Barabbas is a murderer. He's a, a troublemaker. But when Pilate opens up that invitation, they start crying out, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas. And they release Barabbas. And uh, I, I told you all this the other night at the Friday night service, but Jesus took Barabbas' cross. Literally. Jesus got Barabbas' cross and Barabbas got Jesus' freedom. Jesus took our cross and we got his freedom. That's the connection. So the people begin to crucify, say crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And, and Pilate, he says, I, I, I want no part of this man's death. And so he washes his hands of the death. But it's a setup. It's a setup. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. The, the, the disciples, they thought that Jesus was going to overturn the Roman Empire. And now Jesus has been sentenced to be nailed to a Roman cross. They would have watched Jesus. They may not have been there, but they would have at least heard that Jesus had been flogged, whipped, mutilated, and now he would have to carry a 300-pound cross 650 yards up a hill called Golgotha. This did not look like victory. To these disciples, these 11 disciples, this did not look like victory. This looked like the worst possible situation. This looked like the worst possible circumstances. But it was a setup. They watched the man that they had thought would overturn the Romans, be nailed to a Roman cross, beaten, shamed, spit upon, and nearly dead. They would have seen Jesus, the one they thought would be the military power, the king, hanging hopelessly on a cross. And when Jesus died about 3 o'clock that day, any hope that they might have still been holding on to died with him. So let me recap. Unless... Within 12 hours, the disciples have went from thinking, everything's about to change for us. We're about to overturn the Romans. To seeing Jesus hanging helplessly on the cross 
and their hope dying. Sometimes life brings us those kinds of circumstances. But it's a setup. Think with me, if you would, about how the disciples must have felt on Saturday. After Jesus had been laid in the grave, do you know how hopeless they must have felt? Do you, ha, have you ever felt hopeless? Like there is no hope for this situation? These disciples had left everything. Everything because they believed Jesus was the Messiah. They left everything. And guys, they didn't have a New Testament that they could turn over uh, to Matthew 27 and see that Jesus resurrected. They had no clue. He had told them, but they had no clue. They must have felt horrible on Saturday. They had left their families. They had left their friends. They had left everything for Jesus, and Jesus was not what they expected. I think I would have been mad on Saturday. I, I would have felt like I had been part of a Ponzi scheme. I, I would have felt like I, I had been lied to because I put all my hope in this man. I put all of my trust in this man, and he did not come through for me. I, I, I thought he was the Messiah. I thought he was sent from God, but clearly he was not because he just died on a cross, the most shameful way to die. There is no way there is any good in this situation. If you're the disciples on Saturday, you see no hope. You see, they have no idea what's about to happen. They, they have no clue. They believe that they've been robbed. One time, Jesus, the crowds are, are starting to go away from Jesus. And Jesus says, looking at the twelve, Will you go also? Are you going to leave me too? Everybody else is abandoning me. Are you going to leave too? And Peter looks back at him and he, and he says, To whom would we go? We've put all our eggs in one basket, Jesus. You are all that we have. We've left everything else. Where would we go? That's how much they believed. And then on Saturday, they have no hope left. All that they can see on Saturday is darkness. All that they can see on Saturday is hurt. All they can see on Saturday is disappointment. All they can see is that Jesus let them down. You ever been there? Where you just felt like Jesus had let you down. Why did you do that, God? Why did you do that, Jesus? Why did you not come through? Jesus did not live up to their expectations. Has that ever happened to you? You thought God ought to do one thing and he didn't? Happens to me all the time. God, this is how I think. I give God advice sometimes. I, I say, God, this is how I think you ought to handle this. And sometimes he don't do it my way. Matter of fact, he never does it my way. Sometimes Jesus does not live up to our expectations. It's funny, I think, that we call Good Friday good. And it's clear that the disciples did not name that day. Because if you had asked any of the eleven on that Friday, they would have said, this is the worst Friday. This is worse than the worst Friday. This, there, there is no good in this day. Things looked hopeless for the disciples. And you know what I believe? I, b I believe that the disciples honestly thought they had won. That, that they had lost, sorry. I believe that the disciples honestly thought they had lost everything. And I honestly believe that darkness thought it had won. I believe Satan thought that when Jesus died on the cross, or at least when he was dying on the cross, 
I think Satan thought he had a victory. I think he was uh, 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 preparing the arrangements for the party down in hell. I think he was getting things ready for a party. And I think that the Pharisees and Sadducees honestly thought that they had won too. They thought, we finally put this man out of our way. But somebody say, it's a setup. <laughs> it's a setup. The best comeback stories always start with the most hopeless situations. And so I would have to say that this is the most hopeless of any situation. The Son of God, who they had put their hope in, had just been mutilated and left to die on a tree. It does not get much more hopeless than that. The disciples must have been heartbroken on Saturday. But it was a setup. What they could not see was Sunday. What they could not see was Sunday. They could see hopelessness. They could see pain. They could see disappointment. But they could not see Sunday. They could not see Sunday. Let me tell you what happened on Sunday because I don't think you're tracking with me. On, on, spoiler alert. On Sunday, the man they had watched die on a cross rose up again. He come out of the grave. They put him in the grave. He laid there for a little while. And then he came back out. Hope came back alive on Sunday. And so I don't know what you may be going through today. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your home life is. I don't know what your circumstances might be. But you may be going through the darkest season of your life right now. And in fact, you may be going through living hell right now. You may see all that's wrong. You, you, you may see all of the deep darkness. You may be on Friday. You may, have, you may not even know if you can get through the pain for another day. The pain may be so devastating that you're not sure if you can make it another day. You may be in Friday. You may, you may be going through the worst pain of your life. Or you may be at Saturday, you may be thinking, where did my life go wrong? I, I thought that I was trying to do something good. I thought that going to church would make my life better. But, but something's begin to fall apart in my life. Something, everything's going wrong. Where is God? This is not what I expected. You may be on Saturday. He didn't do what you thought he ought to do. He didn't answer your prayer like you thought he ought to have answered your prayer. Could I tell you something? Whether you are on Friday or whether you are on Saturday, there is a Sunday. In your life, the situation may look hopeless. It may look like there is absolutely no way that God could make something good out of it. But I wish that you could go back and talk to the disciples and ask them about how hopeless that they felt on, on Saturday. And, and ask them about the hope they found on Sunday. Amen. No matter what you're going through. No matter how bad it feels. No matter how hopeless it looks. There is a Sunday. Amen. There will be a day when your hope can come back alive. In John chapter 20. John records that on Saturday, on Sunday, Mary went early in the morning to anoint the body of Jesus and to mourn over it. She got there and she noticed something odd. They had put a large rock right in front of the, the front of the tomb so that nobody could come in and get the body of Jesus. But the, 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 the rock that had been in front of the tomb of Jesus had been moved. And she goes back and tells Peter and John, and they run back to the to the tomb to the tomb, and they look inside, and it's empty. Yeah. 
the tomb was empty. What you need to understand is that, that, that Jesus had died a horrible death. He had been laid in the grave. A rock had been put in front of it. And when they came back, he wasn't there. The man they had put their hope in, his body was gone and they weren't sure exactly what had happened. But it turns out that they thought he had come to defeat the Romans. But he had come to defeat death, hell, and the grave. We, he thought, they thought that he had come to be a military power. They thought that, that, that he had come to free them from the Romans, but he came to free them from sin. He came to free them from death. He came to free them from everything that was burdening them, burdening, burdening them down. He came to free them from everything that had been holding them back. He came to free them. And what they could not see on, on Friday and what they could not see on Saturday was that Jesus was working a plan the whole time. And oftentimes we're going through the deepest, darkest parts of our life and there's no way that there's any good coming out of this circumstance. There's no way that any good will come out, out of this situation. But what we don't understand is that God is working a plan in our life. He is setting us up for a comeback story. The moment in history that on Saturday the disciples would have wrote down as the worst day of their life. On Sunday, they would have wrote it down as the best day of their life. On Saturday, the disciples would have said, Friday was the worst day of my life. I hope I never have to have another Friday. But on Sunday, they would have said, I get it now. I get it now. The day I thought was the worst turned into the best. The day that, that, that was my worst day turned into my best day. That's what happens when Jesus is involved in your comeback story. The day that, that they thought everything was destroyed. Everything was made new. The day that they thought that everything was over with. Everything was accomplished. It's all a matter of perspective. We need a Sunday perspective. That one day God will turn this to good. It may not feel good now. It may not look good now. In, in fact, I may not be able to find any good whatsoever. But one day I can look back. And say, that was good. God robbed the grave on that Sunday morning. God robbed the grave. When Jesus died, our pain died. When Jesus died, our hurt died. When Jesus died, our sin died. When Jesus died, our burdens died died. When Jesus raised to life, we raised to life. When Jesus came to life, our joy came to life. When Jesus came to life, our hope came to life. Our future came alive. The cross changed everything. The resurrection changed everything. I believe that today that your life can be changed. Amen. You may be here this morning and you may think that your life can never change. You may think you've done too much, been too bad, gone too far. You may think your situation is too hopeless, that your disease is too bad. But there is hope for your situation. There is hope for your situation. The Friday Jesus died proved 
that even in the hope, most hopeless of situations, there is hope. 